This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Sammy Woodhouse. Sammy, how are we? I'm all right, thank you. How are you? Really good, thank you. First and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Unbelievable story, story of strength, overcoming a lot of pain. you one of the ones who were at the forefront of the Rotherham grooming gangs. Yep. 1,400 people apparently were abused. It's a fucking massive number, massive cover up. Mm. One of the biggest cases in Britain, is that correct? Yeah, so there was 1,400 children, and that was just its base you know, have a, a short time as well. Mm-hmm. So that's not, you know, ever. But yeah, we was groomed, raped, tortured, trafficked, some murdered, and authorities completely covered it up. Yeah, it's mad. And now with social media, a lot of people have a voice mm-hmm. and can then talk about this stuff to then shed light to it, to then yeah. other people coming forward. You were on my good friend, Leon Puffs' t- podcast. I got a really good friend, unbelievable story. Yeah. Got a lot yeah. of information that I needed as well because there was a lot of stuff that I didn't know about. Yeah. Um, so yeah, great interview. And uh, now we're here to do it all again. <laughs> Before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Yeah. Get more of a bit of understanding about you, Sammy. Where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah. So I grew up in Rotherham, a place called Munsborough. And Rotherham, I'd say quite a small town. But my mum and dad, we lived on a council estate. So I lived with them. Got two older sisters as well. And growing up, I've got lots of great memories, very different to how I live now, but I was a very active child. So, you know, I was always out with friends. We had a big field on the back of our house as well. So we always had the bouncing castle and, you know, all the parents had sit outside so we could all run riot on the bikes or playing football. Um, my dad and family was very big, actually, on football. So my dad would take me to all the games, big Man United fans. And yeah, so I was on the girls football team, I was on the cross country team, I was always swimming, ice skating, very active, but I was a dancer. So from age of four right up to age of about 11, I would dance all around the country and it was great. We loved it, you know, we'd, and we was really good as well, our team. We was the team that was known to be. So we was very confident. We knew when we went to those competitions, we'd win gold. And I thought that I had all my life planned out, really. I thought I was going to grow up and, and be a dancer. Of course, it didn't happen that way. Things went very wrong. But yeah, as, as a child, I was very confident. I had lots of friends. I was bubbly. And I think as well, it's important to talk about my childhood because people think that you can only be abused or exploited if you live in a care home. You know, you've you've got... Um, a really bad family or upbringing and of course that's true but there was lots of us that came from just working class families what about schooling I liked school but again I was very sporty so I was very much into you know the plays drama sports that kind of stuff weren't really bothered about maths English science mum and dad 
Um, my mum and dad had a very traditional relationship, I'd say. My dad was the worker, you know, the provider. He, he was always working, actually, my dad. My mum, I mean, my mum had jobs, but my mum wasn't career driven. You know, she'd spend a lot of time working in warehouses. My mum's focus were a kid. So I had a very different relationship with my mum and dad. My dad was the stricter parent as my mum were more like my best friends. And uh, to be honest, my mum and dad were complete opposites to each other. What about sisters? Your big sisters, is that correct? Yes, I've got two older sisters. I was more close to the middle sister because I'm the youngest. There was only, eight, I think, 18 months between us. It was between me and my eldest through 11 years. So I was more close to, um, I won't name her, but my middle sister. Mm -hmm. So going through schooling then, because 14, it kind of all started. What kind, What were you like then? We just... What was life like then? Obviously, you're still young and everything. You're very naive at that age. Listen, I thought I knew everything and um, you're still a baby. Yeah. At that age, I was too... I'd like to think I was grown up, but looking back, man, I was just silly bollocks. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? So what I were was, you like then, 13, 14? Before I was you one of those him? kids, like most kids, where you, th you, you kind of just think you know everything. You don't understand the dangers, uh, the dangers, the risks and stuff involved. And, you know, again, looking back to my childhood, I think... He, I think that played a big role in kind of how I've been able to overcome things. I was very kind of strong-minded. I had, um, I suppose, everything growing up, really. Um, so, yeah, I, and I think as well, when I stopped doing all my dancing and stuff, that's when things really changed for me because I was no longer this little girl that was focused, that was training every single night. I lost my dream, my ambitions, my hopes. I lost everything. And I remember just moping around, you know, oh, my mum trying to encourage me to just go out and play with friends. I think she, you know, if she's alive now, she'd probably regret that. But, um, you know, and I started kind of hanging about on the streets. And because I didn't have any focus, I think that's why things went terribly wrong. But, yeah, I met him just after my 14th birthday. I was with a friend, local shop and a silver sports car started driving up the street. He got out, he started talking to my friends, he already knew her. And I'll never forget the first time I saw him. It's actually really embarrassing now because I look back and obviously I, <laughs> I regret everything. But um, I saw him, he was 24, he seemed good looking, um, dressed really smartly, he was muscly, you know, he had a big gold chain. And he seemed just a normal, everyday kind of lad. Because growing up, I got taught what a paedophile was, and that was some fat old man that, you know, would look out of his window, masturbating over kids in school ground, or somebody that would pull up in a van, kidnap you, and you never see your mum and dad again. That's what we got taught, you know, that was a paedophile. He didn't fit that description. So he asked us to go for a spin in the car, and we did. And I had no idea, but that was a moment that changed my life forever. What was the saying in the car? Um, we were just having a laugh and stuff, really, just talking, chit-chat. And I remember, actually, when we was in the car and um, I was telling him that my mum and dad used to own a snooker club in Masborough and it was called the Rotherham Pool Centre, but it later changed to Sammy's, so my dad called it after me. But that's where my parents first met him and he actually stole my dad's car when he was younger. So my dad drove a Sierra Cosworth, which were a very flash car at the time. So that's how he came into contact, I suppose, with my parents. So when I was in the car and I was telling him, you know, that we had this, this pool hall, etc., and he shot round and he said, oh, are you Peck's daughter? That's my dad's nickname. And I said, yeah. And, and some people say, you know, he deliberately targeted me just to wind my dad up. But as we know now, he was doing it to lots of kids. So when you're driving around the car with him, did it just feel nothing? Was it more excited that an older man was giving you attention? or Because obviously, like you said, you're known as a sex case, as a big fat guy. Yeah. Um, doing weird shit. Yeah. But again, I, 24, was it, were you none the wiser? Were you just enjoying the attention over at that age? I wouldn't say at that moment it was about, you know, attention or exciting. It was the norm. You know, my friend knew him. I knew his brother a little bit. And, you know, all where we hung around, you had children like us, you know, where we was kind of like, I suppose elder people were kind of hanging around. And, you know, sometimes it weren't always people in their 20s or 30s. It were, you know, people 18 and 19 years old. So... 
I weren't the first to be abused, I weren't the last, so it just kind of sent the thing, really. Was there any rumours beforehand of this family? Um, I knew his brother a little bit, but I didn't know about the exploitation or anything like that. I didn't come, you know, to know things about that until I was about 27. But their family was known um, to, to agencies, to professionals as, yeah, being a really dangerous family. And he was involved in all different kinds, um, types of crime as well. So it wasn't just exploitation. He was dealing class A drugs. He was um, known all over the country, you know, for, well, his name was Madash. He was a crazy guy, so he was known far and wide. When was the next time you seen him? Um, I saw him regular after that for two years. I saw him just about every day, um, unless he was locked up, and then he'd throw me from prison. But yeah, the, the grooming process started instantly. And I always say that grooming is a very dangerous, or the most dangerous of crimes for two reasons. It's a silent crime, so it's happening, and you don't even recognise it's happening. But there's also parts of the grooming process that can be really fun. You know, it, it didn't beat me black and blue from the moment he clapped eyes on me. So he, first of all, he came into my world and he found out everything there was to know about me, who my friends were, my family, what kind of music and movies and things I liked. And um, we seemed to have a lot in common because he liked all the same things. All his friends knew my friends. So it was almost as if it was meant to be and then he took me into his world very different very dark very violent and once I was inside it it was very difficult to get out of it but it was I wasn't seen as a victim because my mum and dad reported this you know pretty much straight away because I started going missing sometimes for days weeks even months at a time and the police came over and said well you know Sam's making a lifestyle choice and of course, at that time, I didn't see anything wrong with it. I thought, you know, this guy is my boyfriend. And we did very normal things as well. You know, we'd go to cinema, we'd go shopping. He'd take me out for meals. Um, yeah, it was um, very much like a, a normal and violent relationship. And that's how I saw it. The fucking cop was saying, it's your own choices. You're 14, he's a pedophile. I know. Back and then, though, that's the way, as sad as it is, that's the way it was. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, as well, evidence actually shows that authorities knew about him being a paedophile before he met me. Because as you say, I weren't the first or the last that he went on to abuse. So if they would have actually done their jobs in first place, they could have prevented me even being in contact with him. Yeah, it prevented other, over a thousand other people being harmed. And yeah. Yeah. Did you defend him at the start? So in the beginning, I spent the first couple of months lying to protect him. Um, even though I didn't recognise it as being wrong, I knew I had to keep my mouth shut about certain things. But my parents put me onto a section 20, so that meant that I would go into care, but they would have full parental rights, and they did that thinking that I would be safer, which completely backfired, because once I was in care, they said he could have full access to me, as long as he met me at the top of the street and I was back for 10 o'clock and they wanted me to go to school as well because I'd missed out on so much time at school. So I went back to school on a part-time table. But yeah, once I was in care, that was it. I mean, he met my foster carers, he met my social worker, he even came to Skegness with us. He stayed in um, the local B&B. He went to stay for the weekend, he ended up robbing it, so we left. Um, he was invited to all my appointments and even the appointments that he couldn't attend, he would give me a mobile phone. So the mobile phone would be there, it'd be on speaker so we could monitor everything. Because when I met him, I didn't have a mobile phone. My mum and dad said I was too young. So um, he would give me a mobile phone. My dad would find it, you know, he'd, he'd take it off me. So he started to give me two mobile phones. So if my parents or... Um, the authorities took one. I always had one as a backup. Was he married as well at this time? Yeah, so I found out that he was married with children. And I remember speaking to his solicitor. I still remember his solicitor's name. In fact, his solicitor actually represented him in the trial all those years after. But he sat on the phone to me, told me that he was divorced and that he was the one that had dealt with his divorce, which I know now to be a complete lie. But his solicitor as well, on one occasion, even told me to come to court dressed, you know, in secretary-like clothing so he could pass me off as his intern so he could sneak me into court to see him. 
Yeah, that's strange. Yeah, and, and I, I remember when we went to trial, because obviously this were all on the media, and I saw the solicitor and I phoned the police up and I said, you know, I won't <laughs> say exact words, I've got a swearing involved, but I said, you know, why the fuck is he on, on my TV screen? He was, you know, kind of involved in helping him getting away with this. And he just said, yeah, I don't know. He's still a solicitor, to my knowledge. Did the penny ever drop at that age? No. What, who was, what was like, or were you just naive and oblivious to it all? I saw a lot of things. So I saw um, the power that he had like with the police and stuff. So the police would buy steroids off him. They would give him, you know, like a heads up and pass him information, things like that. So I always knew that the police were corrupt. And whenever something happened, he'd just say, oh, I'll just play it race card. So I know he'd get away with a lot. I mean, there were one occasion when I saw him punch a police officer in the face. Police officer dropped it for, I just got up and walked off. You know, him and his brothers, and this was no exaggeration, they run Rotherham. You know, they had all these authorities in his his uh, back pocket. And if you look at my files now, because I've got copies of all my files, and they knew this was happening because professionals got told that no professional was ever allowed to come and see me unless they were in pairs because they knew people were working for him. What is did you go to care? Um... I think I was about 14. Did that play into his hands because he would have had more control over you? Yeah, yeah. So when um, yeah, when I got put in care, they, they pretty much said, well, you know, you've got full access to her. In fact, he because um, he, he got me a ring at one point and said we were going to get married. And he also got a house, he got a property. And I remember going into town and I would, you know, buy all the little bits and bobs that you'd need, you know, like all your plates and all that kind of stuff. And um, he would take me to the supermarket that was just up the road from Rotherham Town Centre because I had to shop at a certain shop because of halal meat. So, yeah, I would um, go and get all the shopping and I'd sit there and cook his food and, and all sorts. And social care said to me, because we asked if I could move in, um, I was 15 at that point and they said no I could stay there up to 10 o'clock at night I would have to then go back to my foster placement and they would assess the situation again when I was 16. Were you still in contact with your mum and dad and foster? Yeah but at that point um, my dad disowned me he wouldn't even be in the same room as me so if I went to visit my mum I would make sure that my dad weren't there and with uh, with my mum's relationship, my mum never cut me off. Because how a lot of people in my family saw it were very black and white. Why is Sammy picking him over us? You know, they knew it was wrong, but they didn't, they didn't understand the grooming process or, you know, what was happening and things. But my mum, she never disowned me. And that was really important because when I did want to get out, I knew that I could with my mum. You feel pregnant at 14 as well? Yeah. You wanted very, to keep the baby? Yeah, very naive. I thought, you know, me and my boyfriend, we were going to have the clowns, white picket fence, get married, have kids. And um, my, of course, my mum and dad, devastated. They said they was going to use the DNA from the baby to have Ash prosecuted. So, well, his real name's Ash, had the same, but his nickname was Mad Ash. And he said, well, if I go to prison, uh, you're going to get the blame. I'm going to be in prison, so I won't be able to protect you. My family will blame you. Uh, friends will blame you. So I got the abortion, which I didn't want to do because how I saw it was I'm, you know, murdering my baby. And he said that he was going to punch me in the stomach or throw me down a flight of stairs so I'd miscarriage. But he ended up giving me a bottle of something called castor oil. And he said, if you sit in a hot bath, you drink it, the um, the baby will miscarriage and everything will go back to normal. And I remember being sat in the bath and I was crying. And all I could think about is, I'm murdering my baby, which of course that, that didn't work. And I went through with the abortion. Did your mum and dad come back into your life at 15? Um, I never lost contact with my mum. Um, How hard was it not in contact with your dad? Were you happy with that? Because as a father, listen, I've got a 14-year-old daughter and I know the damage I would do mm -hmm. for her, but it must be hard as a father. I'm trying to picture it myself and it already frustrates me. Yeah. So when 
someone has got the power over your daughter and not the father, yeah. it must be so fucking soul destroying. Yeah. It must be soul destroying. Some To walk away though is, I don't ever think I could walk away. Yeah. Either. I mean, the thing is, I obviously didn't think about that at the time. Um, but, you know, going back, my dad would get me pictures. He'd be, you know, patrolling streets. He'd be going to hotels, B&Bs, trying to find me. Um, he was keeping all his own evidence as well and taking it to police. And my dad found my diary. And I remember coming home, all my bedroom had, you know, been ripped up and everything. And he found my diary and he read, you know, everything what I was writing and he took that to the police. And the police actually threatened my dad and said, if you continue to pursue it, we're going to arrest you which my dad didn't care if he were arrested anyway. He kept, you know, just trying to do what he was doing. And my dad went to his family's house as well. He got into a physical fight with him. Um, so I think for my family, they they probably felt, well, what else can we do? Why was the police ignoring that? Well, what we know now is some of the police officers were involved and a lot of the perpetrators, which again, evidence has shown, were Pakistani Muslim men and people were afraid to be called, you know, be called uh, racist or Islamophobic. But I remember one of the police officers called PC Ali, he was actually one of the police officers that I named. When he got told he was being investigated, he, uh, he actually got killed, he got knocked over in a car, but... Um, I remember him very, very well. In fact, he actually asked me out on a date and he actually got access to the police files to get me um, a picture of my perpetrator as well. So he was quite up to his neck in it. But um, I remember him saying to um, my parents when I got pregnant, he says, you know, you need to pray she has a girl because if she has a boy, you know, they're favour boys. Um, he didn't actually want a boy, he wanted a girl, which people said were quite strange. The cop had asked you on a date? Yeah, yeah. What age were you? Um, I'd, I'd had my son at that point, so I think I was about 17. But it was just really inappropriate. I mean, you know, he knew me from when I was 14. Um, yeah, not appropriate at all. Yeah, I won't got, go into the other things, what he got accused of, because it's not my story to tell, but... Yeah, yeah they've got he to have was a named. duty of care, the fucking se the sex case, do you know what I mean? They've got a duty of care of people, and he would have seen your files, he would have seen what was going oh, on. Oh, definitely So did. he's used that as an advantage to probably think he could do the same. Yeah. I mean, when I was missing, the only time the police, you know, kind of returned me home is when I'd been missing for long periods of time, so like months at a time. And I remember um, being in a flat, because I was always moved in flats or houses, and I even stayed at his family home as well. But on this particular occasion, I was in a flat in Masborough and the police came and um, they looked around the flat and he, he wasn't actually there. And they said, oh, do you want to leave him a note to make sure, you know, he knows where you are and that you're safe? And I thought it was a bit of a setup, you know, that, that they're trying to get me to admit that he's, he's here with me. And um, so I wrote the note and I just said, you know, I've, I've, I'm with police, this is where I am. I know it weren't a setup. They generally just wanted him not to worry about me. So, how long were you going missing for at a time? Months. And what was happening in those months? I was everywhere. I, I spent a lot of time hiding. You know, I couldn't go out because I was wanted. And again, you know, very naively, I thought me and you know the love of my life were going to run off into sunset together. But yeah, I I kind of spent a lot of time just hiding being in a room I remember as well this flat that I've just been on about because I just had nothing to do I just clean and clean so you just walk in and just bleach hit you but I started getting a little bit homesick at one point I think he knew that because he started panicking and he's, he's saying you know you're not going to leave are you um so yeah his his mum would cook me some food and he'd, he'd fetch it and then he, he moved me into his family home then so I met his sisters uh, I knew his brothers met his mum uh, I knew that, again, at this point, that he were married, didn't think they were together, but um, his wife was in the property down the road because he had three pop properties on, on a road. What were they saying? The only people that kind of seemed to really have a problem with me were his dad. Why? Um, his dad, I was told, was the more stricter kind of one in the family. Because you were white? Uh, possibly, but I think as well, I fetched a lot of attention to the family because my mum and dad were just constantly reporting um 
So, yeah, I, I think I was just bringing too much attention to it. Did you turn Muslim? Um, not as a child, no, but he, he started being a bit funny with things like, you know, about what I was eating. Um, I had to be Muslim, you know, later on in a completely different circumstances. I was in a domestic violence um, relationship and he'd converted. And yeah, pretty brutal, my experience. I'll be honest, the only first time I've spoke about it publicly was in Liam's podcast. Um, yeah, and I briefly touched about it in court case, but yeah, that's about it. So 15, you fell pregnant again? Yes, but you know, my sexual education which is obviously what I got taught at school, was very basic. It was, you know, how the sperm goes into the egg and the teachers would show us how to put a condom on and we'd just warm up like balloons, you know, I think it's hilarious. And my mum tried speaking to me about sex, which was just so weird because it's my mum, you know. And I, I always make a joke and I said, my mum probably did more mental harm having those conversations with me than actually educating me. But I learnt my sexual education from him and no child should ever get to learn their sexual education from a paedophile. And he taught me things I'd never even heard of, like he anally raped me. There was an occasion when I was missing in a hotel and I just remember how quickly my little body just flew into headboard. And I ran, ran to the toilet, I was crying, I was bleeding, I was trying to make sense, you know, what had just happened, because I didn't even know you could physically do that. And... Um, yeah, and I was crying and, you know, when he did stuff like that, he just said, oh, well, you need to be a better girlfriend, you need to experiment more. Um, so, yeah, I was pretty much just like his sex doll. But I got pregnant again at 15 and I was allowed to keep my son because the authorities said that they weren't going to prosecute him. But why? Is that not concrete evidence then that he's sleeping with a minor? Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, as I say, I got pregnant at 15. There's DNA. And... Up until... Is he on the birth certificate? No. Why um, was that decision? Why did he not want on it for his own he was safety? In, no, he was in prison at the time. He kidnapped somebody and stabbed him about 12 times with a screwdriver. So he got sent to prison, which was kind of a bit like a, a real good thing for me because that gave me the opportunity to kind of distance myself from him and get away from him because... I tried getting away from him, you know, but as time went on, because in the beginning, you know, he was this Prince Charming, and then as time went on, he'd get really violent, but it'd start off with just shouting at me, and then it'd be a slap, then it'd be a punch, then it'd just turn into absolute, you know, crazy situations where on one occasion he's, he's dragged me into the car with me air, he's speeding at the top of the street, he's, and he drove straight into a church, I was actually pregnant at the time as well with my son. So I got rushed into hospital. And then there was another occasion where, again, we was in the car because we spent a lot of time in the car. He was saying if he couldn't have me, no one else could. And he started speeding towards the edge of a hilltop that overlooks all of Rotherham. And he slammed the brakes on right at the last minute. I got out of the car. I was sick. He took me to the edge and he said, you're going to throw me off it. And, you know, I, I thought that's where my life was going to end. And I wet myself. I was that scared. And he put me into the back of the car and just had sex with me as though nothing had happened. And I remember just laying there and it was like just being a dead body on a slab in a morgue. And I just had that constant hurt there all the time. And I knew it was from him, but I just couldn't get away from him. And, you know, there was times when I'd, I said to my foster carer, if he phones you know, I don't want to speak to him. And she'd say, well, you may as well, because you know you're going to get back with him. And then he'd send a load of, loads of flowers to the foster carers and, you know, he'd talk me around. And, you know, there were so many missed opportunities where they should have just got me up and out. And, you know, even on a daily basis, police would stop his car, you know, they'd look round, you know, they'd always tell him off if he didn't have tax or whatever. You know, I was there in front seat. But yeah, they'd, uh, they'd just leave me and they'd only ever return me home if I were missing for long periods of time, such as months. The foster parents should be in the fucking jail as well, the fucking stupid cow. Yeah, I actually asked for him to be investigated and they did. And the report came back saying that they were just taking orders from the council, um, which I don't agree with because there were some things that they did that weren't orders from that council. And there was even a time where they allowed my foster sister into Corium and stuff as well. 
And at the time, I actually had a really good relationship with my foster carers. I liked it because it reminded me of home, but I could do what I want kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, she would kind of say, you know, again, be back by 10 and, and all this. So um, I did have a real good relationship with them. But obviously, when you look back and you kind of look at situations. Yeah, they're not protecting you. Yeah, exactly. There were so many people in the wrong. In fact, I remember when he got locked up and I tried to go and see him. Um, and I was with his sister. And this is actually how I found out him and his wife were still together. And she said, oh, isn't it funny how you, you're both having children at the same time? <laughs> um, so when I got to the prison, they actually said, no, she's not coming in. She's too young. She's a child. Because were you robbing post offices with him? So on my 15th birthday, again, I was missing. And he walked in and he said, I've got a surprise for your 15th birthday. And I expected flowers, you know, to change. He always got me flowers. And he said, I'm going to take you on your first armed robbery. I thought he was joking. You know, he's, he's crazy. So I, I kind of just laughed it off. But no, he, he was actually serious. So he went and stole a car, him and a friend. And I sat in the car with a scanner. So back then, um, they would have big scanners and it would, you know, you could hear everything, what was going off with the police. And my job was to sit there and basically just keep an eye on it. And if there's anything that showed up on the scanner, I had to notify him. So he went in with a gun and, yeah, come out. That's and it's, madness. It is because every time I have my birthday now, I, I think of that. And birthdays for me before that, you know, it was great. Because like I said, we'd have... Uh, we had the big field on the back, so I'd have big bouncing castle, loads of mates, you know, lots of presents. Yeah, so he's kind of just destroyed a lot of memories. But he was criminally exploiting me, so he was getting me involved, you know, in different crime, which is great for perpetrators because it stops me as a victim from coming forward. And when I did come forward, you know, I said to the police, look, I want to be honest about everything, but am I going to go to prison? Because, you know, as I say, he took me on that. He was actually planning another armed robbery, which we never actually even did. But just for that, I was looking at a lot of time just, for, you know, because we sat and planned it. And uh, so all these little things, well, not little things, because obviously very serious things, but all these things, you know, was adding up to a, a long period of time. So when I come forward and expose Rotherham, I was actually looking at 102 years in prison. Was he beating you every day? Um, it, it got to the point where something was kicking off every day um, and I really started shutting down and it would just come very normal to wake up, I'd go and see him, we'd get in an argument. It was usually because a girl had said, oh, well, he's my boyfriend as well. I'd confront him about it. He'd deny it, batter me, um, you know, rape me, apologise, um, you know, say he'll change. And I'd go home to the foster placement and cry myself to sleep. And then I'd do it again and again and again. And then I was also falling out with a lot of friends of this because none of us saw ourselves as kids and as victims. You know, we was, it's almost as if we was fighting over them. So we just fight each other all the time. Under a spell. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was getting a criminal record. Uh, still to this day, I've, I've got a criminal record. I had a fight with a girl. And yeah, it's still on there, so I'm I'm still trying to fight it. And what's really annoying for me is when we talk about the criminal exploitation side of it, he's never once been charged or convicted of any of that. They said that the sexual exploitation, there were that many charges that, you know, they, they had to enroll them off, there were too many. So I've got a criminal record for that, but he hasn't. 15, you fell pregnant, and then you had your son. Yeah. Is, did that potentially save your life? Yeah, I always Because say, you're a strong character, you can see it in your eyes, your presence, yeah. the way you sit, you're a strong bastard, let us yeah. know. Look, I've interviewed people who's went through similar, mm -hmm. um, and they're still broken. It's yeah. not that you're not broken, but you've learned to then adjust and yeah. come over it, to then yeah, you sit with to. confidence, and that shows a lot of strength. But was the son, even your son at 15, 16, was that a save your life to then yeah. become who you are today? I always say that my son, like an angel, sent to me. Um, he's not an angel at all, and I was 23, he's the right little son. But, um, yeah, if it weren't for my son, I'd probably be dead or in prison because it got to a point where I couldn't figure out an escape. So it got to the point where I just wanted 
to take my own life and to act life. I did try and take my own life. Um, I drank bleach, took tablets, slipped my wrists, tried hanging myself. You know, even when he left at 16, the aftermath of everything continued. And because I never got any help or counselling or, you know, way to process everything that I'd been through, it just got bottled up. And of course, when you do that, it just explodes. But yeah, he was in prison when my son was born. He was actually whilst I was in labour, he was on the phone to me, um, you know, saying that he loved me and he's proud of me. His family came up with balloons to see me in the hospital as well. And um, yeah, and then I, I went home to my family because my family got wind that they were going to try and take my son from my care. And that happened to, to some children because, you know, children was having children. Some had abortions, some um, was fortunate to keep their children, some got adopted out or raised by family members. When you say you left at 16, where where did they go? Prison? So, yeah, when when um, I had my son, he was in prison, but then he come out when my son was a couple of months old. And at this point, I'd cut complete contact. So you were pregnant while he was in prison? Yeah. And I said to him when my son was born, um, he could see him, but I wanted it to be in a supervised setting, a safe setting, but I didn't want to see him. And he said, if he couldn't have me, then he, you know, he didn't want to see it, Baby. But I bumped into him in Rotherham Town Centre. And, um, of course, he weren't happy with me, but he tried talking me around and I just stuck to my guns. I weren't having it. But he grabbed me by my throat and hung me over the top floor balcony in the shopping centre. And his friend and his brother were with him at the time. They dragged him off me. And he was going crazy, screaming, he's shouting, he's spitting in my face. He pushed my son's push chair over with my son inside it. My son's only a couple of months at this point. And he's calling my son a black bastard. He's saying he's going to set us on fire. He's going to watch us burn. So I just picked up my son's push chair and I just started running. And I pushed him into a phone box. And I phoned my sister and, you know, she could hear everything, what was going off because he chased me. And again, his brother took him away and at that point I don't even remember how I got home my, my mind went blank but that was the first time I said I would go on official police record and tell them what was going on and that weren't because I was recognizing myself as a victim of exploitation because I didn't for years after I just saw this as this is my ex-boyfriend is violent he cheats on me all the time I just wanted to stop I just want him to leave me alone and I think that must have been a real moment for my mum and dad. You know, two years they've been trying to get me to do this statement and to get away from him. And the police come out, called PC Safra, and um, he said, well, what do you expect? He's got every right to. You've stopped him from seeing his son. My dad went crazy. I thought my dad was going to hit him. He apologised, took my statement, and it was a complete waste of time. They didn't even question him. And at that point, you've got my son's DNA, You've got my statement, you've got CCTV because we're in the middle of Rodham Town Centre and you also had a witness that was my mum's friend who witnessed it all and said, I'll do a statement as well. That moment could have changed everything in Rotherham. And yeah, um, evidence showed that I later made a complaint, men, um, a complaint against a police officer but dropped it. I have no idea why I dropped it. I don't remember doing that, but that's what the evidence shows. So, yeah, again, he went without being questioned. And I pretty much just had to cut off from everybody, you know, whether it be friends or, or whatever, because he was just going around, you know, trying to, trying to find me. And I had a flat, actually, at the time. So he found out where I were. And when he was saying in town centre he's going to set me on fire and me and my son and watch his burn somebody actually set fire to, um, to my flat. It uh, started off with a wheelie bin, somebody saw it, got put out, so there was no major kind of harm done. But I ended up just having to move back in with my parents. My parents had to move as well because he just never left me alone and he was sending people to the flat door with gifts and money trying to, you know, I suppose, buy me back. Who was it for your mum and dad when you came back to the house? Um, when my son was born, I think my dad thought, you know, I either help her or that's it. You know, she's keeping baby 
you know, that's it. So he decided to support me. So I became very close with my family again. Um, so, yeah, and then I, I went to work. I bought a little tanning salon with my dad. And, um, yeah, just, I suppose, tried to move on the best way I could. See, it's a tough one because your dad is girl in it. So as me, man, it's it must be, it's hard to walk away from your loved ones knowing what they're going through. Mm. Especially looking at it, you think it's love and you've got, like you says earlier, you, this big man and he's giving you gifts and this and that, but you're being groomed, you're being raped, you're yeah. being exploited. And you're being completely yeah, manipulated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, brain, you're being brainwashed. You're yeah. under some sort of weird spell and it must be difficult for our father because even and I understand it because you're just young you're being groomed mm. so it's not a case of you're in your 20s and you've kind of went through with it all yeah you're fucking I think people young. forget just how young we actually were yeah 14 you know people expecting me as a 14 year old there were children younger than me you know to to take him on his family you know gangs of rather because we weren't just going up against him and his family we're going up against the police. We're going up against Rotherham Council. My case even proves the Home Office No, when the Home Office were actually instructing people not to act in my case because they didn't want to upset him. So that's why I had to go and get my own private court order because they wouldn't, they wouldn't get me one for him. So, you know, we're kids going up against the entire system. And, you know, I'm doing it now as an adult and it's pretty brutal. So I don't know how people expected us to do that as kids. It's insane. So what happened then once you were back in with your mum and dad? Um, things was all right. We we kind of just had to get on with things, I suppose. Social care closed my case. They said uh, we was a decent enough family. And I, I always say if I would have got help and therapy back then, my life would have been very different and I wouldn't have gone on to make a lot of the bad choices that I did, especially in men. Um, <laughs> that's another show. <laughs> <laughs> but um yes yeah, so i my way of dealing with things was work i just threw myself into work and i think because i had so many people saying to me whilst i was being exploited including him that i was gonna amount to absolutely nothing you know everyone said oh you'd end up a smack head and you and i remember him saying you're going to be in a council house with 12 kids nobody's going to know, know your name um so i had it drilled into me kind of constantly now that I was just going to be nothing but yeah I just threw myself in into work I got my own business I started modeling I started working in the clubs and that was just my way of dealing with it and then when my son was probably about four years old he got shot um you're not your son the son yeah dad. not my son my son's dad yeah and at first we got told he was dead Turns out, no, he were alive, he was just paralysed, so he's now spending the rest of his life in a wheelchair. And my mum, dad and my family thought that was great. You know, they were celebrating, this is karma for everything that he's done. I actually felt sorry for him. And I thought, oh my God, I need to go and see him. And I didn't, because they, they said, um, you know, the people involved, they know who you are, they know who your son is, it's going to put you at risk. So I didn't go, but yeah, my me, me mum and dad thought it were great, but their celebrations didn't last that long and a couple of weeks after my mum just all of a sudden dropped dead she was very young as well just before her 47th birthday um of a brain hemorrhage how was that for you the, the only person that when i say the only person but the one who stood by you through thick and thin to then not turn their back and always be there and always have that door open for when you're ready yeah um i'm gonna get emotional <laughs> i always get emotional when it comes to my mum or my son, but yeah, she, you know, she was my best mate. So, yeah. When does the penny drop with it all that? With my mum? Yeah. I don't think it ever has, if I'm honest. I think because the next day I went to work, because when, when she clapped, she was actually on the toilet and um, she clapped. And at first we thought she was having a stroke and... My dad was the, the first I found and, you know, he would shout in for me to come in because my son was here, um, my, my niece and things as well. So the kids saw her. Um, so my dad shouting at me um, and he's on phone to ambulance. And I remember trying to get her to sing because I knew if, you know, you had to keep him conscious. 
And I don't know why I, I picked this song, but I just started singing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. <laughs> and I was trying to get her to sing it. Um, but yeah, I remember saying, um, Babby, me head hurts. And yeah, that were it. But she was, um, she was kind of still conscious. So even when they took her into the ambulance, you know, she was sat up in a chair and... Um, the kids as well were stood up on the window so they could see the ambulance. And even for years after, every time my son saw an ambulance, he'd say, Mama, because, you know, that were um, her name, what um, what they called her. But, yeah, we switched off the the uh, life machine a couple of days after. But my mum always said that she wanted to die young. She didn't want to be ill. She always said if she couldn't hold her babies, which was babies, um, then she didn't want to be us. So I suppose she, yeah, she got what she wanted, really. Yeah, it's always tough. And my dad, he passed away with leukemia. And I always blamed myself because I was a loose cannon back in the day and I was always bringing trouble to the door. And I think with stresses and pressures, I always thought, mm. he never seen me shine. Yeah. You know, I had greatness. He never seen that. He yeah. seen me when I was coming out of prison. He seen me addicted to fucking drugs and drink and yeah. gambling. Yeah, he you do think about the stuff. worst of it. And sometimes, I don't know why it is, but. And obviously you were only a young girl, you were being manipulated and groomed, but do you ever think, was it my fault? Yeah, oh, t when I when I started to come to terms with, actually I'm a victim of exploitation, fir first thing I did was blame myself. And I thought, how stupid, you know, was I not to see it? I felt guilty for not just what my, my parents had gone through, but my son as well. And yeah, I came suicidal. And that's when I when mental health got involved um and that was kind of the process of me coming forward and exposing Rosaram. but your mum would have been in a good headspace to have seen you do well and have your business yeah. and be a good mother she would have seen the great side yeah. of it so it's I not mean, a case of, uh, can you imagine it happened and again you're still a baby so you can never blame yourself for yeah. what you went through but as a human being we kind of always I, well, for, I can only speak for myself but blaming myself for other things that happened yeah. around me even though it's out of your control but you think oh, I should have done that better yeah. I mean my mum my mum were always proud of me my mum were one of those where like um, you know my sisters would tickle tackle on me and, and tell us stuff um, you know that I used to do in fact one of the things were with the arm robbery and, and my mum was no no she won't do that you know she wouldn't have a, a bad word always have your corner me. yeah <laughs> and I'm like no no like you yeah. <laughs> seen you walk into the yeah. bank with a gun but yet that wasn't my baby <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, she. Um, but yeah, I mean, even when um, you know when I had the business and I was doing modelling and working in the clubs and stuff, and you know I was earning d really decent money, but my mum didn't want me doing it, and you know she she'd always said to me, you know you you deserve more than than that. So um, but yeah, she she was always very proud, and I always said though because I always try and make peace with her, you know, passing. If my mum didn't die, I wouldn't have gone on to have done. I probably wouldn't have even gone on to expose rather than in the first place because everything that happened in my life after that, I suppose, made sense and happened for a reason. Um, so, yeah, in in some ways she saved me. When you say your mental health slipped, was that when you became suicidal? Yeah, so kind of through life, because I never, you know, kind of dealt with what had happened and I went into domestic violence relationships, I went into safe house, um after the fucking pedophile guy yeah yeah so i made yeah lots of terrible choices when when it came to men and i'll be honest i've not had many relationships i spent a lot of my life being celibate nearly nine years but yeah i was in a domestic violence relationship it's safer isn't it? <laughs> honestly it's the best thing i ever safer. did it's i've gone back celibate again it's hell, man. It's safer. I'm, just about to say, I'm making a joke of it because laughter sometimes is bad medicine but i think yeah <laughs> fucking hell man look with everything you've been through and uh yeah it's understandable though uh, how do son, you learn to trust my son really wants me to meet someone especially my eldest son and um and when i came out myself i actually went on tinder <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's uh, ain't gonna find anyone saying on that I can't believe I've admitted that in fact we'll yeah. have it uh, but um, no I, I did try it I, I tried dating and um, I think because I'd spent so much time being on my own I've, I've just not been able to adjust to it so yeah, yeah. I've, got, I've gone back to Helbert now but 
Yeah, it's it's peaceful. And I think as well it's dangerous when you spend that much time on your own because I've just got so used to it now. Yeah, it's peaceful. That's all I want, man. Everything to do is, in life is to do with peace. Yeah. And it's difficult, especially because when you become in a relationship, so many people now, especially in the UK, everywhere in the world, but everybody's got different levels of trauma. Yeah. You just don't know who you're dealing with, what you're dealing with. Even yeah, people exactly. come into my life like, a lot of people struggle coming from, but then you says earlier, you came from a good mum and dad. Yeah. But a lot of people are coming from the broken homes, which's fucking them up even more. Now you've got social media, everybody's competing, everybody's sad, everybody's yeah, creating a fake life. Into, I think yeah. everybody are just becoming so confused. Divorce rate is on the rise. Suicide's mm -hmm. on the rise. Sometimes it's good if, you, like I say, I've got my kids and I'm just happy being around my family. It's just mm -hmm. easier, it's safer. and Yeah. All I want and all that makes me happy is I've got my kids, I've got, grandchildren now as well i see one of them um i've got my family i've got work that's that's the only things i'm i'm bothered about so he's been shot a few weeks later your mum passes away what happens with life then so yeah my mum passed away i moved out i met my youngest son's dad so he was black man converted to islam and when i met him um didn't really kind of seem to be religious or anything like that. Um, but kind of quickly into it, you know, I'd, I'd sit and he'd pray all the time and, and things like that, which I never really thought out of it. You know, I weren't a religious person. If he wants to be, then crack on. But, um, yeah, he started turning very violent, very controlling. It was never um, sexually violent towards me. It was always physically and emotionally. But, yeah, we control what I ate, what I slept, uh, sorry, what I wore. Um, I had to live like a, a Muslim woman and a very strict Muslim woman, not a Westernised Muslim What's the woman. Um, I think if you're Westernised, you will see women working. They're allowed in opinion. <laughs> I weren't allowed in opinion. Every time I open my, my mouth, I seem to get slapped. Um, I suppose they can have, have a life, I suppose. I couldn't. I How could hard have... was it then when you seen the the sort of similar patterns for the first wrong into then the second did you know or were you just were you so broken down that you couldn't I didn't see it because it was different and when when I was being exploited as a child even though he's very controlling but he allowed me to have friends he'd rape them all but I was allowed to have friends I was allowed to go out and, you know, do things. And he he wouldn't say, um, you've got to keep covered. He'd, he'd even encourage me to wear a skirt and stuff. Um, he was he started being a little bit funny about food, but not too much. So with my youngest son's dad, it was complete opposite. It, and, and as well, what you've got to remember is I'd gone from, you know, being very confident, modelling, working in the clubs to all of a sudden living like this. So it was a real shock to my system. But yeah, um, I went into a safe house, which weren't actual because of him, it was actually because of something else. But when I was in the safe house, I think the staff could see what was going on and he was allowed to pick me up and things. But um, they tried talking to me because even like things like my cutlery, my cutlery weren't allowed to be near anybody else's cutlery and things like that. And I kept collapsing. I was heavily pregnant with my uh, second child at this point. And I went to the doctors and the, and the doctor said, it's because you're covered. You know, I had all these layers on because he said I had to. Um, but it was in the summer, I was heavily pregnant. So I just kept collapsing, I was overheating. So all these professionals could see what was going on. And my son was born and he phoned me and he said, I'm going to come and see him tomorrow. I told him what name I wanted to call him. He didn't approve, but he said, I'll come and see you tomorrow. And that was the last time I ever saw him and it was the best thing he ever did. He actually contacted me a couple of years back when uh, I started exposing Rotherham. And he sent me a message, he apologised and I never even replied to him. He's only just trying to cover his own ass. Yeah, and the thing is as well, you know when I exposed Rotherham, everybody were popping up. One, mm. they were like, oh shit, she's got a book coming out, am I in it? And then people thought I was earning a lot of money, you know, I'm doing all these media interviews. People think you're you're earning millions. And the truth is, I turned all the money down. I didn't kind of start and turn it into, I suppose, a career till after the court case. And even that funded me work because I was self-funded and not government-funded. So the first one, 
what happened when he found out you were pregnant or anything? Was he off the scene then? The guy who was raping you and abusing you, was he off the scene completely? Or was he still trying to look for you? When he got shot, he left Rotherham. So we kind of vanished out. for a little bit, yeah. But then when my son got to, I think it was about nine years old, my son got diagnosed with ADHD, which, again, I didn't know what that were. Um, people had to explain that. My son had a lot of difficulties in, in that respect of things. But, um, yeah, professionals said, well, you know, what if we get in contact with his dad? And I remember saying to him, well, my mum dad thought he was a paedophile. And again, you know, all the files show, you know, what happened um, when I was little. But he was in a wheelchair. So I didn't, you know, kind of see if he, if he could be violent towards me. The emotional side of it, I never even saw of. Um, and my son was saying that, you know, he wants to see daddy and meet his daddy. And it was the worst decision I'll ever make in my life, but I agreed to it. And he said, so the professional said he'd not been in trouble for, I think they said five years. Um, Is in a wheelchair? Yeah. Yeah, obviously he's not so, in fucking trouble. What yeah, can he so, do? Wheel himself to the post office. Yeah, so I thought, you know, he's been shot, probably changed his life around. He ain't fucking raping anybody in a wheelchair. Exactly. So, yeah, I didn't see kind of any risks in it. And, you know, I'd but still... Did you not think about what he had done in the past and... No, I think I was so mentally unwell at this point with everything that had kind of gone off. I just weren't thinking clearly at all. And as well, I'd cut off from all my family. So I was literally on again? my own with the kids. Why, yeah. why again? Um, I, I don't speak about it. Okay. But um, yeah, I was on my own. I was in a very bad place. I was very suicidal. And when I was reaching out, you know, to to support services and professionals... And I'm saying, you know, I'm very suicidal, I need help and all this. They said I weren't severe enough. It's absolute nonsense. I was severe enough. Um, what have you got to be to be severe enough? Fucking dangling from a rope? What, I know. What, what is I it know. you've got to be to be severe? I know, that's I, think, I don't know if it's because of your tone. Mm. Because, like I say, you come across very confident and that is what it is, story, mm. and this is my story. You've got to remember, I've not always been like this. Yeah, were well, you different? That's what I, I, yeah. can't, I don't know. So I don't know if you're speaking like that's because you're not in tears and breaking your heart. It's it's difficult because if somebody yeah. automatically starts crying and breaking down people's yeah. instincts and they feel sorry. There was times when my whole body, I'd just sit there and shake. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it was just, at times it was really, really bad. And I was that unwell. I just thought, God, he might actually help me. You know, I might actually be in a better place for it. So, and I still remember the first time my son met him and I spoke to him a little bit on the phone first and I made it very, very clear in that first conversation, I didn't want no religion to be around him. Because um, I'd obviously learnt now about religion and, and things, but I, I didn't want my son to be a part of that. But I... Um, yeah, I remember my son, he was jumping up and down on the sofa, so excited, couldn't wait to see him. And he pulled up outside with his brother, because his brother were now caring for him. And he came in, in the wheelchair, my son just, you know, grabbed hold of him. My son thought he was great. And for a while, again, you know, it did seem to be all right. And then I started to realise, well, actually, he's, he's not changed at all. But... We started it off gradual and then my son went to stay with him and my son really liked it at first. And um, he seemed to be doing better in school. So instead of me pulling my son away from him and his uh, his family, I moved down there where they were because they were living in Goal at this point. So I got a farmhouse in Goal. So the plan was me and him were going to do, I suppose, like shared custody, you know, like most parents do. And um, I, I started to notice things. Um, all my money stopped, you know, which were, were strange. And when I was phoning up and they were saying, oh, you know, they've got full custody of him. And I'd phone him up and I'd said, do you know anything about this? And I'd be like, no, I don't know what you're saying. Um, the school were, were trying to say that I weren't allowed to go into school for appointments and things. Um, and it kind of seemed like everybody around were kind of shoving me out the way and what I found out is they'd said that there was a court order in place saying that I weren't allowed near my son which were a complete lie and they was trying um, to get my son circumcised 
And I found out about it and I phoned the doctors up. I said, you go anywhere near my son and I'll sue you. Um, so, yeah, they was trying to just remove me out of the picture. And they were saying that my son has to be religious. They were saying that he was going to have to be married to his cousin at 12. And I remember my son being sat there. And, you know, again, he's about nine years old at this point. And he's sat there telling me how much of a wonderful husband he's going to be and all this. Um, it was just very bizarre for me. I, I just didn't want it. And, um, yeah, his, his brother was, was just getting really weird about things as well, trying it on with me sexually and stuff. And, yeah, they've got a very different mindset to what I have and what I've grown up in, if that makes sense. But, um, yeah, so I packed up and I left and I come back to Rotherham. At this point, I just started talking to my family again, or at least my sisters anyway. And they said, well, come back to Rotherham and we'll help support you. And that was when I started to, I suppose, recognise that I was a victim. And my sister phoned me and she said, a solicitor wants to speak to you. She wants you to sue Rotherham Council and South Yorkshire Police. I said, I'm, I'm not interested in doing that. Because, you know, at this point as well, I'm still being threatened by him and his family. Um, I just wanted the whole thing to go away. And um, so I said no. And then not long after, I walked into a petrol station and there was a newspaper article saying three brothers, three Asian brothers had befriended, I think it was like 54 children. And it was very important how that was worded because if it would have said um, three Asian brothers exploited 54 children, I didn't know what exploitation was, so I would have walked straight past it. But I knew it was those three brothers because of how prominent they were in the town. And I read it and I had a breakdown. And I was just coming to a realisation with everything. And I thought, oh, you know, this is my fault. I can be so stupid. I felt guilty. I thought, what am I going to tell my son? And I started to think about all the different girls, all the things I'd seen, and I suppose just puzzling things together. But yeah, I had a breakdown, and my sister phoned the mental health team. And I even wrote a letter. So this weren't a cry for help. This was me being, you know, deadly serious. I wanted my life to end. And I wrote a letter to my kids. And um, I thought my kids would be better off without me. And I thought that for a very, very long time. You know, even when I got good professionals working with me, they were trying to, you know, to help me, make me feel better. You know, and they was saying, you know, your kids need you and all this, and I just couldn't see it. But I started talking to a professional, and she said, you know, I think something really bad has happened to you. Because what I found beforehand when I was trying to get support for my son, and, you know, you'd have a professional come in and say, okay, tell me what's happened, and we go through my life. We get to age of 16, and then that'd it. Closed book, they'd go, I'd never see him again, I'd get another professional. But yeah, this was a professional that actually said, you know, I think something happened. So she phoned the police, I agreed to go on record, and the police officer came, and I recognised her. I recognised her from when I was a child, but she also dealt with something else I'd reported a few years prior. So I knew I was going to get nowhere with her. But I said to her, you know, I want you to go away and see what evidence there is to support me. And she came back with a male police officer. And I actually recorded it on my mobile phone. And it's a good job I did because it, it helped me expose Rotherham. But she said she wouldn't like to use my son's DNA evidence. So they were refusing that. She said, because my son, with his ADHD and the mental health side of things, um, you know, that could harm him. I said, well, I remember police officer's name. I can sit and give you a list of their names. And he said, well, you know, they're not going to come forward because they're going to get in shit and loads of jobs for you. And um, I said, what about my safety? They said, well, we can't put a cop outside, you know, all the time. So it was just a very lazy, can't be bothered attitude. So I said, okay, I'm not going to take it further then. So I got a solicitor and I went and got all my own files, social care, police, school, medical. I got everything. And I had the tape recording of the police officers as well. And I contacted Andrew Norfolk at the Times newspaper because he'd actually been running information and a story 
before me. So I weren't the first to come forward. And um, I told him everything, what happened. I gave him the evidence and he published my story in August 2013. But I'd not waived my anonymity at this point. I was called Jessica. And I'll be honest, I thought I was going to be completely ignored because everybody before me had been ignored or been investigated and nothing come of it. And I remember Andrew saying to me, if this don't work, nothing's going to work. You know, this is our last chance at Rotherham. And what we was able to do, because of how much evidence that I actually had, was I started naming people. I named a politician, a Labour politician called Jahangir Akhtar. I named my rapist, Arshad Hussain. I named police officer PC Ali. And how I was able to name them was, when I was missing as a child, um, a no prosecution deal was made with my perpetrator. So what happened was the police and Jahangir actor, which was actually a relative of his, who went on to be deputy leader of Rosam Council, made a deal and said, if you bring a bat and drop her off at a petrol station, you won't be prosecuted for it. So he fetched me back, dropped me off, and he left and got away with it. And he was actually found guilty on that particular incident when I managed to, to take it to court. But yeah, I was able to, to name people and this, I suppose this is what I'm, I'm most proud of with my story is what it achieved by me speaking out. And it opened the criminal investigation, which is now the biggest in our history, which is led by the National Crime Agency. But um, to begin with, it was being dealt with by South Yorkshire police. And the police, when the Times went to them for a right to reply, they came to me and said, right, you've got a choice. If you run the story, it will jeopardise the investigation. Or do you want the investigation? And I almost nearly didn't go ahead with my story. And thank God I didn't because, well, I'd, I would have been in prison for a start. But, um, yeah, I decided to run the story anyway. And it turns out it jeopardised absolutely nothing. It actually worked. Everybody was coming forward. I was doing interviews. And it ended up being... Yeah, one of the biggest cases in the country. But it also commissioned the Alexis J report. So the Alexis J report was a one-year investigation that showed we were telling the truth. It showed there was 1,400 children groomed, abused, raped, trafficked, murdered. Majority of the men doing it were Pakistani Muslim men. Majority victims was white, non-religious children. Um, and people covered it up because they didn't want to be called racist or Islamophobic. So, you know, this was a big moment for us. I mean, I'll be honest, I was a bit worried of thinking, are they, are they going to actually tell the truth about what happened? It turns out they did. So, yeah. How it, many men were charged? In total, I have no idea now, because there's just, you know, kind of cases ongoing all the time. And you've got to bear in mind that I opened that investigation in August 2013, girls are still going through the court process right now and they will be for many years so my case is finished it took three years to get to court so we got to court in 2016 um yeah it was a really big case I was towards the back I was known as girl J so whilst I was waiting to go into court not only was I seeing everything in the news and stuff I also had to move um they were sending people to my home I got told that um, they was also trying to have me murdered. There was one particular time when the, case, the, the court case had just started and they'd placed two tags on my home, one for me, one for my son. And early hours of the morning, every alarm on my house starts going off. I'll be honest, I was absolutely petrified. I thought, oh God, this is it. You know, they've come for me. Because they was actually sending um, a woman to my house, recording me. I was actually trying to help her. I thought she was a survivor. You know, I'm, I'm trying to help her come forward. And the whole time it was set up, they were recording me and things. So it took the police over five and a half hours to get to me whilst I was one of the key witnesses with two tags, the biggest investigation in our history. I couldn't believe it. So they had to move me. Um, so, yeah, I was moving house and everything. So as well, 
I weren't allowed contact with my sister. My sister and my dad was witnesses in the case. So they said, you know, if we spoke over that time, it could, you know, jeopardise things because we had planned something. Um, they allowed me a phone call, but the police had to monitor it. But the hardest thing was for my son because, you know, he's got to deal with this is his mum, this is his dad, he's, he's very young. There were no professional in our country, still is it to this day, this is what I'm campa- campaigning for. There was no professional that's actually been trained in dealing with children born from rape. There was for me, you know, I'm a victim of exploitation, I've got a voice in law, I've got support services, I'm recognised as a victim. My son didn't have any of that. And a lot of professionals didn't want to work with us because the amount of media attention that were on it. You know, this was now a, a worldwide story. I'm a motor mouth in, you know, in, in pressing on social media, not listening to, to what police are telling me. Um, you know, even when we got to court, they tried to put um, a media ban on it. And I wrote a letter and I gave it to Andrew Norfolk. He gave it to the judge and I was explaining to the judge of why it was so important to lift the media ban because we'd been silenced for years and years and this is it. You know, we finally got our chance to have everybody listen to what's actually gone on. And it worked. They lifted it. Police were like going mental at me for it because I didn't tell them. You know, I just I just went ahead and, and did it. But Rotherham Council also served me. We had gagging order, ignored that, just continued me me interviews but yeah it was really difficult because I felt as well I had everybody coming at me because even though I was only testifying against him I was cross-examined by his brother's barrister but I opened the criminal investigation so I had everybody that's now under investigation blaming me all their family members so you know there were times when even their wife would you know on social media abusing me um, a couple of people in his family were also arrested for intimidation and, and charged. Um, the professionals, I was naming professionals, so I had all them and their families to deal with. And even the other activists, you know, they was giving me a real hard time. So it just felt like everybody was coming at me from every single angle. And when I look back now, I don't know what's actually harder, me going through the exploitation itself or exposing it and everything that they tried doing to me. Because they didn't just come for me, they came for my son as well. What was it like when they started getting charges? What was that feeling for you? Um, because you would have been blaming yourself, other people blaming you, calling you a liar. Yeah. Everything you made up, was that a kind of, okay, I'm doing the right thing? Yeah, what was really good for me is speaking out. Because when I first come forward to Andrew Norfolk, bearing in mind I was suicidal, you know, I tried to kill myself, still blamed me and... When I came out, I don't even think I was scared um, so much of the, the rapes, even though I know, you know, I'll get my consequence one day. But it was, I suppose, society itself. I thought they were going to blame me. And when I started speaking out, you know, all these people tell me how brave I was and, you know, that I'm inspiring. And I'm like, oh, wow. So, you know, I was I was getting things off my chest. I was talking about things. It was building me. It was, you know, getting me confident. Therapy. Yeah. And I don't even know if ungroomed is a word, but I, I suppose for the last 11 years, I've ungroomed myself whilst the whole world was watching. And I was doing interviews 18 hours a day, seven days a week. So every single day, you know, people around the world are watching me in my therapy as such, so like when people say to me, oh, well, you know, you've got a different view now to what you had back then. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Of course I have. What was it like seeing him for the first time after he'd done all that to you to then seeing him in the wheelchair? What was that feeling for you when you seen him again? It, it was really strange. Because Were you not scared? Not when he was in wheelchair, no, because it was so fragile, so weak, and I wasn't used to seeing that. Like when Did that give you your power back? I didn't see it as a power thing, no. I felt more like I wanted to care for him and help him. Because I always mentioned uh, Jeff Thompson, who's a good friend. He's a ninth dan, mm-hmm. one of the biggest killers on the planet. He was abused by one of his teachers okay. when he was like 13, 14. He called it the parasite because he never spoke about it and let it get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. He mm-hmm. became a killer, nearly killed a man when he was working the doors, became very violent. Yeah. And um, he's seen the man. Bear in mind, he's visualised killing this man mm-hmm. every time. Because that's what he does now. He's a trained killer, ninth yeah. dan. Um, 
he's seen his abuser in the cafe. Mm-hmm. Jeff froze. Fucking froze. Yeah. This guy's a killer. Yeah. And he had to get his head together to get round it and he approached him. Yeah. Once he says to him, he realised how weak and evil this person was and from that moment he says the parasite died yeah. and um, he took his power back yeah. and he didn't want to be violent no more. I think because, you know, back then I'd still not recognised myself as being a victim. I would have seen things very differently. If I saw him now... um. I'll be honest, I've, I feel like I've moved on from what he's done for me in the best way I possibly can. But there are things I know what happened to my son, which I don't speak about publicly, that I will never get over. And, um, yeah, there's there's been things I've wanted to do, which I probably shouldn't say because I probably get locked up with, with everything that's going on at the minute. But, yeah, it's been very hard to deal with things in a non-criminal way. Yeah, because you'd have visualised um, killing the cunt. Yeah. Let's be honest, your um, dad would have visualised it many times. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, let's say, for example, if me and him are in a room now and there's a gun on the table, even though I've moved on, you know, with my life, would I pick it up and, and shoot him? I'd have no problem doing that. Probably yeah, quite enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'd be like, that's for me, so you so fucking bastard. bastard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How so, long did the court case last? It was three years. It lasted three years. Yeah. It took three years to get to court and then three years for the court case to end. So I opened it in August 2013. We got to sentencing beginning of 2017. How many witnesses? There was like over 100 in total. That's not just um, survivors. That was kind of a whole with professionals and, and everything, which... Um, they said it took so long because there were just so many. Even though you're exposing the biggest grooming gang in the United Kingdom, you were getting told that you could potentially get over 100 years in prison because of the post offices and the things that you were involved yeah. in. Is that correct? And, you know, this, the, what's what's interesting is there was eight defendants in the trial. Two got not guilty, so that left six. And in total, they, they were... Did they deserve to get not guilty? Well, I'm legally not allowed to say that. I, I didn't know them too personally. Um, no evidence. But I was told a lot of people were shocked they got not guilty. Yeah, scumbags. Um, but yeah, legally, obviously, well, they got not guilty, so you know, mm. I'd say it. But um, yeah, so that left six. And in total, they got 102 years. So I was looking at that by myself. I weren't grooming kids. I weren't raping kids. I didn't do any of that to kids. You know, the things I was doing is like, you know, putting somebody's window through if they pissed me off or, you know, being sat in a car whilst he's on an armed robbery or doing things that didn't even actually happen. So I was looking at the same amount of time as all of them, um, which was crazy for me. But yeah, I didn't find out for weeks if I was going to get charged or not. So my... um, law firm had to go meet with the police. I don't know if the CPS or whoever was involved. And they had to say, okay, so what did she allegedly do? And they had to kind of work it out. But I always say, if I didn't have the times back in May, I, I think I would have been convicted. The, I felt very, very safe having the media involved. And I think that as well is the reason that I weren't killed for it. Bad protection. Yeah, because I know things were trying to, you know, they were trying to get people to do things to me. And a lot of people were scared because of the media. Because you went to court, did you not? You could have sat behind the screen and gave evidence, but you actually went. Yeah, it was important for me to go in because I wanted the jury to see me as a person. And um, there, was, there was a screen there, so I don't know who on the defendant side was was in. But um, yeah, I was only meant to be in for two hours. And I was in there for two full days. And... Um, I remember at first, you know, he's, he's asking me questions and you're only told yes or no. That's it. That's the only advice that you're given. But with some of the questions, I, th- I thought this is not just a yes or no. I need a little bit of an explanation. And I kind of felt like he was just destroying me. So I just thought, fuck it. You know, this is my time now. I'm just going to go in there and I'm just going to, I'm just going to explode kind of thing. And I would just talking and talking and talking and that's why I was in there for, for two days because, you know, anybody that knows me knows I don't stop talking once I start. And I'm really glad I did that 
because I got a lot of things off my chest. I was also able to get things into court, which weren't originally allowed evidence-wise, which, of course, I didn't know that at the time because you, you don't get to find out things like that. But um, And I remember at the end as well, and uh, he was saying to me, oh, I can't remember exact words, but he was saying, you know, you're a hero, you've, you've done this and you've done that. And I was expecting him to say, but you're lying. And he didn't. And he kind of just said, you know, I kind of made that I was a, a really good person. I was quite shocked by that. But kind of throughout my whole evidence, there weren't really much about my actual abuse. You know, there was a kind of couple of questions and that way he said, I think he said I was 18. He met me in a nightclub, which is nonsense. He would come to school, he'd pick me up from school, you know, I'd truant from school. I'd, I'd be wearing my school uniform. And I even remember on, on one occasion we were sat in the car and I was reading to him and he always used to tell me how clever and intelligent I was because he weren't very good at reading, he weren't very well educated. So I'd read to him from his school books and things. So, <laughs> and, Fact <play. laughs> so um, yeah, he were, he was very well aware what, what my age were, but most of, of what my questions were were around the media. So they had to prove all my interviews and all, all that kind of stuff. And they said, oh, you know, you've made all this money. I was able to prove that I actually refused all the money, um, so they couldn't use that against me. But even after he got found guilty, they said, and this was on sentencing as well, and, and the courtroom was packed, you know, all, all the floors. We got told we were only allowed to fetch one person, we because of that many people. And they said, you know, we'll accept everybody else but not her because I was treated as the girlfriend and the mistress rather than, you know, a victim. So even after found guilty, we're still trying to get off with it did you know they were getting found guilty no when i was there um well i wouldn't go to the the guilty verdict or guilty or not guilty because if they would have got found not guilty i don't know how emotionally i would have responded to that so i i stayed at home so. yeah because it's a weird one because not only is it your abuser but it's your son's dad yeah so it's uh it, listen nobody's there's not many people lived what you've went through so it's nobody can really judge it mm -hmm. so it's difficult but i'm trying to look at it from all aspects yeah. and from a bit of yeah that's great at that he's got the guilty but then my son so mm -hmm. you couldn't really celebrate if you know what i'm saying is that and, the way uh, it was yeah and when um when he got guilty and i was actually in bed with um a doovie over my head and andrew norfolk text me and it's a guilty 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 the five counts for me and he's probably the best person that I could have got that news from because not only did he you know publish my story but Andrew Norfolk throughout that whole time were pretty much like my therapist you know there was times when my story broke when you know I was just so paranoid of everything and I'd ring him up like two three hours in the morning thinking oh my god I think I think they're gonna come they're gonna kill me and you know he could have just took my story and left and he didn't it you know he stuck with me so, yeah, it was nice to to hear that from him, but I got straight in the shower and I went up to a charity that I was attending at the time, actually later went on to expose it. But, um, yeah, the first thing I wanted was for me to tell my son, because obviously all the media and stuff were there as well. And I think as well, it was really difficult because my son has not only got his dad to deal with, his entire family, every male member of his family we're on charges. It's all over the press about um, Pakistani Muslims. So this really affected my son's identity. So there was even times, and especially as well because of what he'd gone through, um, he wasn't allowed around a Pakistani man. So even in taxis and things, we had to ask for a driver not to be a Pakistani man because it would trigger him. So there was so much we had to um, think about with my son's eye, um, well, to protect my son and, yeah, we, his identity even started talking, like a asked the fair because, you know, he couldn't ac accept what was going on. So, yeah, it, it was really difficult for him. The sentencing, <laughs> so, for me, listen, he should have got the fucking death penalty, yeah. but the sentencing is massive because let's be honest, the sentencing from this stuff here in the UK is lenient. Yeah. That's why people keep doing it. That's why they keep reoffending yeah. because they're getting community service for fucking raping kids and it's crazy and um, grooming kids and yet yeah, people are getting three years and four years for Facebook posts and I know. Um, 
It's so it's, it is, it's madness. But the sentencing was magical. Yeah. Like, let's talk about the sentencing for your abuser. It was actually the highest in the country at that time for sexual exploitation. He got 35 year. And I think I think we got a good judge. I think she was very clued up and educated about, you know, these kind of crimes and things. And, you know, for our case, we actually made history on quite, you know, some, some quite good stuff. And I thought that would carry on throughout the country, and it didn't. So I think, you know, because of all the attention that were on it, you know, did they kind of just try and, and do that for that reason? But, yeah, so, um, but what they should have done with that sentence and he said okay you've got 35 year I agree I personally think a death penalty should be and I think he should have got it with you know all the evidence against him but um what they should have said is you're not allowed to make any contact whatsoever with her and her son and you have no parental rights whatsoever because after that I had to go on and deal with a family court situation and, you know, never in a million years did I think on that day when I thought, this is it, you know, my life starts now, I've finally rid of him, would I think, oh, well, professionals one day are going to invite him back into my son's life, even though he's in prison for 35 years. But that is exactly what they did. So, you know, even now, I'm a grandma, so my youngest grandson is two. He can apply through the family courts to have a contact order with my grandson. And there's nothing legally I can do whatsoever. Yeah, that needs to change. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get law change. I mean, I, I did an exposure about it in 2018. I could have, again, got sent to prison for that as well. And Rotham Council invited him into court proceedings to apply for either contact or full custody. And they didn't even tell me. I was sat there in court. And the social worker says, just to let you know, he's not coming. And I said, who's not coming? And he said, oh, should I say in? And what I know now is he'd not collected the court papers. And even me, for work, he said to me, you know, you kind of be in, <laughs> so kind of just in shot. And I, I were in shot, you know, she was shot that I weren't kicking off. I was just in shock that something like this could happen. Now, you know, I've proven that is a danger to me and every other child there. There was damning amounts of evidence what had happened to my son, which I, I understand it's not public knowledge, but, you know, the agencies knew what had happened. So they knew he was a risk to me. So he's not on the birth certificate. You know, there's, there was nothing positive about him, you know, or what he should... Sorry, I said all that wrong. There's no good reason or why he should have been allowed to see my son. You know, it just would have put him at risk. And as well, my son's actually testified in court against his family members. So he could have just said at any time... My son's going to go live with my family. Now, they were threatening at one point to come and kill him. It, it just, it's mind-blowing. But, yeah, I exposed that again with Andrew Norfolk at the Times. Um, and I've been trying to change the law since it's so far being rejected. So, the fight continues. How was it for your dad having to go through that court case and hear everything? Um, I don't know. I, I don't speak to my dad. I don't oh, I have any that. relationship anymore with anybody in my family. But I'm... Um, I mean, I'd, I'd kind of spoke to him a little bit afterwards, but yeah, I obviously can imagine difficult. Uh, I'm a parent. Yeah, so. How was it? Did your mum come into your head after the court case? Yeah, I actually took some jewellery with me to court when I testified in my mum's. Yeah. Um, she would have been proud of you though, eh? Yeah, don't, she'll set me off crying again. <laughs> but um, yeah, she would have, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um in a way, it was shame that she didn't get to see that day because, you know, she hated him. If I remember, because at one point, my mum and dad separated before she passed and she moved into a bed sit and it was directly across from his house. And I was like, what, what are you doing? And they, they actually went and smashed all the car up and everything. She'd come back home. But yeah, she, you know, she really did hate him. How was it then once they all get sentences? Did you ever feel any sort of... Not closure, because you'll be dealing with the pain for the rest of your life of what you went through. There's, everybody mm. de deals with kind of levels of different traumas. But what you went through and how you've overcome it, and how you're still here to tell the tale is, is unbelievable. That You've got mm. nothing but strength. I've taken my hat off to you. It's unbelievable. You. Um, I respect you so much. But how was it after it all? Was it a sense of relief or were you still feeling? Well, after it's sentencing, I kind of thought, oh, that's it now. It's, it's done with. 
obviously safety wise you know all this time I, I still think one day somebody will come for me so I've always kind of got to watch over my shoulder but yeah my fight legal fight still to this day has not stopped and it won't until they change the law so we can't see my grandson and people say oh well you know they wouldn't allow it I know they're allowing it you know people are speaking out they are allowing rapists to have contact with their children there's you know let's be really honest about what's happening a man is going and raping a child or a woman getting her pregnant and then taking her child from her and our law allows that and you've even got professionals outside of the courts inviting paedophiles in and I've been saying since 2018 children are being trafficked through our system and there's evidence there to see it I mean, after my case, they did all the, the big investigation with a harms report, which showed the harm that was happening. There's other women still now anonymously speaking out because, you know, you, you still have to be anonymous because, well, you can be sent to prison, can't you? Yeah. Because it's official court documents that you're leaking. Listen, paedophilia and paedophile rings, it's rife. It's at an all-time high. And more things are getting spoke about it. But if you speak about, out about it, then you become a target. Yeah. So... We understand, look at priests, look at anybody in the healthcare system or the social mm -hmm. work system who's been charged. It's um, They do these things for a reason because they're hitting vulnerable children who can't speak out. Mm -hmm. And I always mention this woman as well, Barbara O'Hare, she released a book called The Hospital, okay. called her crazy. Um, she was running away to the police. What happened, they would have a checklist, get kids from broken homes, get kids who are addicts, get kids yeah. who are homeless. So they would sign them off as crazy. So they were experimenting on these kids using MQ Ultra, killing these kids, mm. raping these kids. Men Jesus. would drive up in suits, big fancy cars, take the kids away, bring them back six yeah. hours later. It doesn't surprise me. She would run away, report it to the police. The police would check her name and her file. She was on the file as crazy. Take mm. her straight back. Yeah. And tried. it came out, it was all true. Fucking Aston Hall, yeah. The horrors are I think I've heard of that book actually. Um, I'll have to read it. And it, it shows you the levels of it. So they're just manipulating the system. These yeah. people are high up in the system. Oh, it goes all they can way cover to it the from top. the top to the bottom. Yeah. You're not talking about the fucking fat guy sitting in the little council house across the road yeah. who's banned from going to schools or whatever. You're yeah. talking about the billionaires. Yeah. You look at your Epstein, you look at your Jimmy Savile, exactly. look at how well connected these people are. Do exactly. you think it's a fucking this is just it just falls into fruition? Of course not. It's all planned, yeah. it's all a big game. Exactly. What these people do with vulnerable children yeah i mean when when i were trying to i mean when my story got published it took a year for the j report to come out so for a year What's that? so the j report is what showed 1400 children in our town have been um abused and everything so for a full year i only had my evidence so when i'm saying to people you know all this happened i didn't know it were thousands i thought it might be a couple of hundred but um, and I'm saying to them, look, the police were involved, social care, and all, and all this. People branded me as crazy, and I even got told that I had to go on medication, and if I stopped taking it, they were going to try and remove my children from my care. I also got told that um, if I didn't stop campaigning, that they were going to try and remove my children from my care, and I like, even one um, support worker that I had at the time. She actually met with Rotherham Council and tried having my son placed into some kind of unit where contact with me would be completely cut off. He'd have no contact whatsoever. Now, bearing in mind, he's going through the most difficult and traumatic time of his life. He needs me in his life, not to be totally cut off. And thankfully, Rotherham Council, you know, agreed with me and said, no, we're not doing it. I mean, her nickname is actually the um, Baby Snatchers because she's known as trying to have children removed um, and in some cases actually being successful. How bad are these grooming gangs? Now, we talk about, listen, you're far right, racist, whatever. I don't give two fucks what people yeah, yeah, say. Yeah, I'm past that point. Yeah, like, listen, the UK is 82, 83% white people. The majority of sex cases are white, which is understandable if you've got 82% white people in mm. the UK. But grooming gangs, you're talking 6% of people in the UK are Asian Muslim. Mm. Um, but the percentage of people in grooming gangs is 82 or 84%. Mm. Um, Asian Muslim, is that correct? Yeah. Well, I've I, I got stats in front of me, but when I worked on the um, Home Office report, so the Home Office did a report and then they called people like me and afterwards and said, mm. okay, what do you think about this? And um, if there's one thing that really stands out 
for me for that report is that they not collected any data and still to this day they're not collecting data properly so there's been exposures on that as well but if you look at towns such as Rotherham and then you've got Rochdale and all these places when an investigation is done it is showing that majority is committed by Pakistani Muslim men of this particular crime you know of this type yeah. of so abuse for me it's the fucking hang all the sex cases that's the only way it keeps children safe like I said I don't mm-hmm. care what colour you are what religion you are do not give zero fucks but when there's high percentages of certain things something's broken yeah. and we can't target every Muslim man or any man of different colour white, green, pink brown, exactly black, but we because, should be able to yeah, talk about it we've got to be able it, to talk about it because I go that. to Dubai mm-hmm. best city I've ever been to in the world clean Muslim city mm-hmm. unbelievable fresh yeah. tax free uh, people are thriving yeah, it's so you can't target Muslims for everything it's not right because I know many Muslim brothers and sisters mm-hmm. who are amazing yeah. great people great family morals certain religions listen I'm not a religious person you can yeah, look into every religious and take kind of that kind of seedy satanic shit out of it yeah, there's definitely. also beautiful things from it as well but mm-hmm. we've got the, we're, at, we're coming to a stage now in life where people can't speak out and how they're feeling as I can yeah. say I'm parent if you're going to a march or whatever, you can't be getting caught far right. Everything's far mm. left, far right. Different opinions. People need to be sitting down and going, okay, this is a serious problem here. Yeah. Look at the immigrant side of things. And I had a man on, Lee, who was an undercover migrant. Mm. Now, I'm all for refugees. I'm all for people coming away from war stricken places to have a better life. Listen, the UK and America have destroyed the majority of the world with their wars. So mm. if people want a better life, but when you then go to... Europe and you've got people coming over on dinghies, no background checks, no passports. Yeah. You're becoming an illegal immigrant. There's, there's it's got to different. be things in place. Yeah. And if kids are getting harmed and women are getting harmed, yeah. there's got to be things in place to go, okay, listen, no, but if you're coming for a better life, by all means, be who you want to be. Yeah. I travel the world. Yeah. I, but I go with my passport. People know who yeah, I exactly. am. I'm, I'm spending it, yeah, money. I'm not sleeping through the fucking borders and, and causing yeah. destruction. So do you? how bad is the grooming stuff now? Is it still as rife or did the Rotherham stuff kind of i think exploitation is um unfortunately something will never stop it's it's just as far if if not more now but what the difference is we've now got the online stuff um you didn't have facebook and instagram and all this when i was a kid so there's it's a lot easier for pedophiles to access children now but as well you know majority of of abuse is actually happening from people that we know so people you know, in, in our own home, such as, as parents. So that's why I've, I've campaigned around the education side of it and said, well, you know, kids need to be able to come into a safe space and be educated in an age-appropriate way about grooming and stuff. And I've gone into schools. I mean, I do a, a very different talk, mm. but I go into schools and I educate kids and things um, because, as I say, I didn't have that proper education. But what we need to be doing as well is not just, you know, saying to kids, oh, this is how you don't become a victim. We need to be teaching them how not to become a perpetrator. Because, you know, if you look at the, the families and stuff, I mean, if you look at that family in particular, they've got three older brothers and then they had a younger brother who was my age. So there was, you know, that age gap. Now, you know, some could even argue, well, if, authorities would have stepped in they should have removed the younger son he might not have gone on to be a perpetrator he's he locked up 19 TV years become a sex case as well yeah, 19 years he got so yeah but i think we're in a much darker place now than what we was back then and i always try and be hopeful and i've worked in government and media for 11 years and I'm I'm out of that now at the minute, and you know I kind of just feel a bit angry towards it. But I don't even want anything to do with them because I've I've seen firsthand how corrupt some people. Are. I've seen them lie, um, and I've seen just how some people just don't give a shit about kids. I mean, if we look at the COVID stuff, if we look at the riots, of look how instantly they changed laws and caught um, overnight court cases are popping up. Why can't they do that? for perpetrators that are raping kids or beating women. Why do you think it is all a big cover-up with paedophiles? It's it's because we have paedophiles running the actual system. I don't think they care about people like us. I don't think they take it seriously. Um, And I think that's why a lot of it's been covered up. It's a sad day when fucking somebody's getting three years for a Facebook post, but yet nonces are getting community service. Exactly. I've, I've been talking to people that have been arrested just for standing on street watching. 
But yeah, and you know what's annoying as well, right? You know, when my perpetrator were arrested, it took three years to get it in court and to get sentenced, right? DNA from my son proved that I was 15 and he was 25 when, when I got pregnant. That's DNA evidence. He could have been remanded straight into prison. He didn't get remanded. He, he was bailed for three years. But yet you've got people throwing stones and nicking bath bombs that are remanded and straight into prison. How big was the Rotherham scandal? How big was the cover-up? Oh, it's huge. Every, you know, everyone was involved. Like I said, I've got evidence of police, council and the Home Office. I've sued the police, I've won. Sued council, I won. Um, 1,400 kids as young as 10? Yeah, that was minimum. That was only a short period of time. How many numbers are we talking in the, the Rotherham scandal? Um, I don't know how many there is now because there's always court cases, so, you know, the figures always change, but I think at one point it was nearly close to 2,000. And as well, there's a lot of lost voices in that. I've had women from Pakistani community contact me and say I've been abused as well but I was never allowed to tell anyone because it will shame my family I won't be able to get married I was contacted by quite a few boys as well who were um, exploited one actually contacted me he wanted me to help him go public to share his story he's now passed away he got um, hooked on drugs throughout this and you know there's all that kind of side of things that we don't hear about there's People that aren't as fortunate as what I am to get out, you know, not to be addicted to drugs and all that, because drugs never played um, a role in my exploitation. But for many people, they did turn to drugs. Yeah. Some, you know, have overdosed. But as well, some some are still married to perpetrators. But you're talking thousands of people. And like you say, there's a lot of people who haven't got a voice to come forward. And they say the stats mm -hmm. as well, one in third become abusers themselves. Yeah. So it's just kind of setting more people up to do yeah. the wrong things. And, and as well, if you think about how small of a town Rotherham is... What's right? the population? If I'm honest, I don't know, but it's it's, it's a small town. Mm -hmm. But if you've got, you know, so 1,400 survivors, they've got mums, they've got dads, they've got sisters, grandparents, you think all those people that have been affected and there's not one professional in our town that have been fetched to account. I mean, even recently, because of all the threats and intimidation I've had for exposing it and stuff. And, um, you know, as I say, I had people coming at me, you know, left, right and centre. I even had video footage of a professional that I was a witness against. Comes to my house. So she's at my house with someone else, takes pictures, uploads my full address with pictures online. They then go to my sister's house take pictures of her house, they actually stalk her and follow her and the pictures prove that because she's in different locations. They put a car car registration on and upload it all over social media whilst I'm, um, you know, the witness in, in biggest investigation in history, knowing full well I've got people, you know, coming at me to try and kill me. And that's what they did. And because South Yorkshire Police screwed case up, never been held to account. CPS said, oh, well, go and sue. What do you think needs to change? To Everything needs kids. to change. I think this system is completely unfit for purpose, and I think that's how they want it. There's um, sentences are just shocking, poor. You are fortunate to even get in a courtroom. There's children being criminalised for being exploited, you know, due to criminal exploitation. There's thousands being left with criminal records. We have these men that have raped us that can have contact um, or even full custody of our children there's not proper support in place there's not proper funding um yeah i could i could go on all day to be honest and, and this is young girls and young boys boys are involved as well yeah you know a lot of people just focus on girls and i know figures show that this happens to majority of, majority girls. of girls but we should give all children a voice and a platform we all matter definitely how are you feeling with it all now do you um, ever get rest from it? No, I don't think I, I ever will, if I'm honest. Do you ever want to, though? Do you think if you stop, then things could end up sending you fucking loopy? But I yeah. you've got to kind of keep busy and keep exposing and keep doing, trying to do the right thing. Yeah, I did take a bit of time off. If I, I were actually leaving industry 
Uh, my plan was, just before Labour come into power, um, I was going to go and get a job that had nothing whatsoever to do with activism. And I was just going to push on those last couple of campaigns, which I don't even need to work in government because the, the politicians know me work. They, they know what I'm asking for. And, yeah, I actually went and got a job in a warehouse. Um, and then Tommy Robinson happened <laughs> and fetched me back. Um, so, yeah, now I'm working for Urban Scoop. And I'm glad, actually, originally I said no, and then I changed my mind. And I'm, I'm really glad I did because... I want to give other people a platform and be able to share their story because I get so many people contact me saying, you know, Sammy, this has happened to me. And it's always a horror story. You know, if you said to me, tell me something good that's happening, I won't be able to, to tell you. It's always something bad. So I think it'd be nice for me to give other people a platform and, and I suppose try and change country in a different way. What do you think of the state of the UK now? It's shocking. And it's it's at the point where I think, God, do I even want to live here? And I've even, I mean, I've been saying to my kids for a couple of years now, you know, how would you feel if we moved abroad? The kids don't want to and I'm not leaving them. But there's also the point as well that, you know, his brothers are starting to come out of prison. So one of them's coming out in just a couple of months. How just, old are they now? Um, well, I'm 39, so probably about... In the 50s. 49. Well, he was 10 years older, so we'll be 49 now. But his brothers will be about 46, 47. But remember, they're sex cases. They'll need to be looking over their shoulder. Yeah. Do you remember that? And you've got a lot more support than them. Yeah, that's so true. So you've got to understand the level of support you have from your bravery. And like I say, they're fucking sex cases. They're mm. rapists, pedophiles. Mm. Anyone who should be concerned coming out of prison should be them. Anyone who should be concerned... Mm looking over their shoulder should be them. Anyone who should be sleeping with their fucking eyes open should be them. I and I guarantee, listen, because your story's out there far and wide, listen, violence solves nothing, but there's people out there who do God's work as well. Mm. And just for, for you know, people go disappearing. These people, listen, these people work in packs yeah. alone. They ain't fucking nothing. They're nothing in packs anyway with yeah. the shit that they've done. But alone, they're just as fucking fragile and scared as anybody on this planet. Yeah. They'll be shiting themselves just as much as anyone. I hope they are. They will be. It, it feels like I'd it's imagine they've been protection. Those. They must be in mm. protection. Yeah. I uh, Especially we being in a wheelchair as well. I've heard a couple of stories that they've been attacked and things. Oh, that's just what I'm saying. They're, yeah. they're fucked and, and good. Fucking good. So they'll not be... You'll not be on no list. They've mm. done what they've done. They need to accept yeah. what the devil has planned for them. Yeah. So they need to look over their shoulders. People's not going to come out and celebrate them because people are seen in the streets walking about with them. They're getting tired as a fucking pedophile as well. Yeah. Well, I hope their lives are made difficult because ours is. Yeah, 1,400 it, people. It, yeah, it feels like it's us that's got a life sentence. Yeah, and that's something that you will need to deal with, but mm. you'll need to be at the forefront and show the strength for others not to then suffer. Yeah. Do you count your blessings that you never took your own life because you're leaving not only two sons behind, but you're not only leaving your kids behind, but you also might not have got the result of the exactly. grooming gangs in Rotherham. Do yeah. you count your blessings that you never actually went through with that? I know, I know. So yeah. Are I'm you there. lucky? You feel lucky that you never actually took your own life? Um, I think that everything in life happens for a reason, and yeah, I, t I think if I would have gone, it would have it would have been a lot worse, and of course, Rodham wouldn't have got exposed because it would be naming him. So yeah, things could have been very different. And I know some people don't like me for exposing Rodham because they went through it like I did, and they were kind of just happy and moved on. You know, they've got families; they didn't want it all dragged back up. So I know some people aren't happy with me, but it's something that needed to be done. And not just for Rotherham, but for the country. Because Rotherham changed a lot in the country. Even though, you know, the system's still kind of terrible. But look at how much we got changed when we exposed Rotherham. Yeah, but it had to. It did. It had to. And the sad thing is, if you did take your life, you would have been hard as a liar, as this and that. So mm. now you've got, you had the chance to then set yourself free, help other kids. Your strength has then helped others. Like you say, it's not going to stop what's going on between kids and paedophiles and grooming gangs and child trafficking. It's happening to a... They're saying it's took over the drug industry. Yeah. Because it's yeah. not just raping the kids and selling the kids for prostitution. 
It's also stealing them from their organs and selling it on the black market. So it's a very luxurious exactly. I mean, industry. If you, if you look at drugs, you know, let's say cocaine, you can sell a bag of cocaine once, that's it. You've profited once. With your child, you can do absolutely all sorts. You know, you've, you've got the images. So the images can just be sold and sold. Then, of course, you've got the abuse, the rape, the torture that you profit from. And, yeah, as you say, um, and not just the organs, but the blood. Um Mm-hmm. And oh, what's the the drug called now? Um, I forgot what it's called adrenochrome and adrenochrome, all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, when you're trafficking kids, there's a lot of profit to be made. How are you feeling today? Yeah, I'm all right. What's I'm your plans right. for the future? I want to focus on um, giving other people a platform, helping them share their stories, and continue my work, and just be just be happy, really. All I'm bothered about is that my kids are all right. My son is probably the best he's ever been, but he's still on his journey. Um, we're in a really good place at the minute because our relationship has been really difficult. I just want us to be happy, be mm. a family. What about your book? Yeah, so I've got a book out that came out a few years ago. That's called Just a Child. So How that- can people buy that? That's available on Amazon, and it's. I wanted to use it as well as education, so it's got something at the end that can educate parents and professionals. Because I'll get a lot of parents contact me and say, you know, Sammy, this is happening to my son or my daughter. What can I do? So yeah, there's some advice on there as well. What should people look out for, Sammy, for their children? Because a lot of people are naive to how the grooming gangs kind of work and or predators kind of work is a, and mm. there was an interview with a man who was a high profile paedophile and he was interviewed and the guy says what do you look for and he says I look at the father I mm. look at the father to see if he's a threat or not before I make a move on to the children oh. so he did it was online many years ago and it was very interesting so men out there man get your shit together mm. I think the best thing that parents can do if this is happening um, to their children is gather as much information and intelligence as you possibly can you know keep a diary keep everything down because you know that could help in convictions and things and just you know do what my mum did just be there leave that door open for when you know that child's ready to come and talk to you see my daughter's not allowed sleepovers yeah she's never had and she fucking hates me for it but <laughs> As a protector, as a father who is very overprotective, that's just the way I am with every yeah. family member. I but, think you have to be these days. Um, there's there's but, just too much yeah, going on. With the people who I interview, they've got to give me some leeway. Do yeah. you know what I mean? And understand, well, wait a minute, Dad, okay. Yeah. But we've got to be careful as well because not everybody's bad. Mm. But I would rather be safe knowing that you're under my yeah. roof, knowing that I'm my, there. My kids say that I'm I'm too, too much. Like my eldest son, like his mates used to come in because... As well, I prefer to have all his mates around our house. And social services even got involved and said, um, I weren't allowed to enact to kick him out on the street and I refused to do that. I'd rather um, be on back garden or in house. I've got cameras there, they're safe, I know where they are. But um, yeah, his mates would come in and start and tell me stuff and, and me some like, no, shut up, telling her stuff, she's a snitch and all this. Um, and yeah, I remember my youngest son, uh, a few years back, he wanted to sleep out and I said, right, I want name, date of birth and everything at parents and stuff because I'm going to run a check. And he's like, oh my God, no, you're just being weird and you're being too much. But yeah, you kind of have to. For anybody watching, Sam, and it's maybe stuck in a life of struggle right now, maybe going through some sort of pain that you went through, but you came out the other end. So what advice would you have for them? The best thing that anyone can do if they're going through anything is talk to someone about it. You don't have to be police, you don't have to be social care. You know, it can be a friend, can be, you know, just a, a helpline. can be anyone, just just talk about it. Don't keep it bottled in. Sammy, what's your social media links and stuff for people maybe want to get in contact or reach out and give you, ask maybe any questions because you know yourself how hard it is for someone to come forward, but with your story and it shows the strength and it, mm-hmm. you can come out the other end even though you'll still have your moments, but... Mm-hmm. What can people, how can people get in contact with you? I'm on X at Sammy Woodhouse One. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. And I'm just setting up a website as well, which will have all my information on. So that's sammywoodhouse.co.uk. So that'll be up and running soon as well. Sammy, listen, 
nothing but love for you. Proud of you for everything you're achieving. Thank Can't you. wait to see what you do for the rest of your future. I'll be watching. And uh, listen, God bless you. Thanks for today. And I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you for having Thank me. You.